Fine. So um, welcome again. So I'm going to talk about scientific workflow systems for next generation sequencing analytics. <coughs> so there are two or three slides introduction. So I'm coming from Humboldt Universität in Berlin. Berlin actually has three universities. They're all quite big. They all have around 30,000 students. And I'm part of the Humboldt Universität, uh, which is founded by Wilhelm from Humboldt and not Alexander from Humboldt, what usually everybody thinks. We are around 35,000 students, uh, and the computer science department has about 15,000 students and 20 chairs. So my own group, it's called Knowledge Management in Bioinformatics. We work in biomedical text mining, scientific workflows, functional bioinformatics. We are quite applied. So we have uh, around five or six concrete projects running together with people uh, from biology or from medicine. And so we are always a mixture between building infrastructure and uh, trying to apply this infrastructure for functional bioinformatics or for translational medicine today. So th these are names of projects that we have in my group. And, and now the blue ones, for instance, are projects where we mostly focus on infrastructure. So we build distributed systems, next generation sequencing analytical platforms. One of these projects is Biobank Cloud. This is why we're here today. And then there are other projects where we, where we work in, in with real diseases and with pathologists and oncologists and so on. So oncopathes on colorectal cancer, codonators on colorectal cancer, thesis is uh, immuno, uh, cancer immunology, uh, BSIO is integrative oncology, MAPTORNET is um, another form of cancer. So it's, it's, it's a quite diverse uh, set of different projects. Yeah, our, our most important partner, let's say, uh, therefore, is a university clinic. So it's called the Charité. It's uh, actually older than, our, than my own university. It claims to be the largest university hospital in Europe. I don't know if this is true. It is fairly large. They have 30,000 people, about 4,000 MDs, about a million treatment per year. They move, I don't know, 3 billion euros every year. And they are very, very slowly realizing that there is something going on with next generation sequencing. So it, it, it's kind of a different perspective from what mm, some of you might have here. So we are always talking about 100,000 genomes, population genetics um, projects. Uh, this, from my experience, is, is very interesting, but it's not the bulk of the projects that are going on in next generation sequencing. So all the projects that we run at the moment, they have like a dozen sequences or 100 sequences, maybe 100 exomes. And there are really many of these. And it's only slowly uptaking to a larger scale. Actually, it doesn't look like this at the moment, but it looks like this. Uh, so they have to uh, renovate the main building of the Charité. This is costing 100 million euros. Um, so that's, that's uh, also the kind of scale that they very often think about. Yeah, so now they realize sequencing is becoming a commodity. Uh, sequencing a dozen or a hundred genomes or exomes is feasible now for any mid-sized research projects. It's not very expensive anymore. I would expect in, in like five years, many of our partners <coughs> will start sequencing a couple of hundred genomes or a couple of hundred exomes. This will more or less be the scale that we will see. In Germany, we are really a, f a federal country, so we will not have any national-wide sequencing effort, sequencing 100,000 Germans or a million Germans. I, I cannot imagine this will happen for political reasons. Um, of course, there are these projects. So there are national projects outside Germany uh, where, where we now plan to sequence 100,000 genomes. Um, when we're talking about these masses of samples or these masses of patients, a real bottleneck that, that is new to the bioinformatician is uh, to have access to all these genomes. So bioinformatician didn't used to care about who they are sequencing. There was anyway only one or two, and the sample just came from somewhere. Yeah, that was the the model over 20 years or 30 years of bioinformatics. So through the whole uh, Unum Genome Project, they actually didn't know what they are sequencing. They were just so busy with trying to get some sequences. But now, as we want to get into this uh, area of hundreds of genomes or thousands of genomes, we, they suddenly have to talk to the medical doctors because these are the people that have the samples. And so this is really changing the game, and there are new there, there are interdisciplinary work that is now going on because these are really quite different uh, communities. So access to the genomes is really becoming crucial. Bioinformatics goes medical in a way. And this is also where these biobanks come into play because the bioplanks should be the, the places where you collect all the samples and where you need to get access to all these samples. <coughs> okay, this is producing this data tsunami. Everybody knows these slides. Um, 
what if, if you talk to a, a medical doctor or to an oncologist, then what, what they see of this is uh, a picture like this. Um, when you think about a couple of years ago, then most of the money you spent in a sequencing project was on the actual sequencing. Uh, because this was so expensive and so slow. This is the blue bar. And the downstream analysis, the bioinformatics, was quite cheap because there was only one or two genomes. You didn't, you, you didn't need 100 machines to, to analyze one or two genomes. And this is now changing and changing and changing. And the computational part is taking up more and more and more money. And this is really very frightening for many of them. So um, they are not used to this. This is a quite new perspective. It will need more time to get into the heads of the funders, of the medical doctors, and so on and so forth. So just a little story. The, in Berlin, we recently built the Berlin Institute of Health. It's a 300 million euro project over the next five years to booster translational medicine. And they asked for millions of monies for buying sequences, uh, Illumina sequences, and they asked for millions of monies for, for doing all these large-scale clinical studies. And the single most important comment from the reviewers at the time when they applied for the money was, you forgot the bioinformatics. So they bought all the machines, <laughs> uh, they were renting all these rooms, and they were having so much money in the medical part for, for designing these studies, and then they asked for one or two bioinformatics. So that was the main comment, and they had to redesign the entire project, and now they, I, I don't know, now they have 10 or 12 positions for bioinformatics, and this is still not enough. This is by no, no way this will be enough. But it will really need more and more time to get into uh, the head of these peoples. Okay, so this is how they view it today. Will computers crash genomics, so they blame us, computer scientists, for not being fast enough or not being volatile enough to support their uh, increasing flood of data. <laughs> So when we look into this downstream analysis, what will we see? Well, this is an example abstract workflow for uh, variation detection. Um, they, well, th this is a typical pipeline that you run when you want to make sense out of this next generation sequencing data. I will not go into uh, any details here. You all know these pipelines. For me, who originally comes from the database world, uh, it was quite interesting that I mean, we, we have seen these data flows over 30 years. We call them execution plans or relational algebra plans or whatever. So we are quite used to work with these many operators where one after the other operates on some data and transforms it. But in the relational world, you have only four or five operations. So you, you can do a lot with these plans. You could do an optimization, reorganization, and so on and so forth. While here, all essentially all of these boxes that transform the data are are black boxes or user-defined functions are very, very special purpose programs that do something. And there's very, very little general operations that are performed here, like a selection or a projection or a join or a union or an intersection and so on and so forth. I mean, there are some of them there, but they are very, very, very few. So the program is called quality filtering, and it does something, and you have no clue about what it does. Yeah, you just call it, and then it does something. But it's very difficult to, uh, to describe it in an abstract way. Yeah, these these Structures are called workflows or pipelines or data flows, so I will not uh, differentiate between this. And they essentially are made of two building blocks. So the first one is the tags. So these are the nodes in the graph. Uh, they have some input and output ports that are usually connected to a type, so they expect a certain format of file or a certain parameter. And then they are executed either locally or even as a web service. So it could as well call a remote machine and, and retrieve some information, look up into a database. Uh, and from the perspective of the entire data flow, they are typically black box implementations, as I just said. And these tasks are connected by links, and they connect input to output ports, and they essentially move data. And they either do it by storing a file and then reading a file, or you can have a network channel, or you can have it in memory, but somehow you have to move the data that is produced by some task to the next task that is going to read this data. So there are two main issues from my perspective if you look into these data flows. So the first one is that many people here are really um, uh, working on or are doing research, and that is runtime. I mean, the, the data volumes are larger and larger and larger. This high seq X will generate 18 terabytes a week, and if you want to run any of these workflows, you need some parallel infrastructure. So you need to do something to, to finish this in reasonable time, in hours or whatever you expect. But there's also a second aspect that I think is very important, and that is variety. If you look into different projects, then there are hundreds of different pipelines running. And these hundreds of different pipelines are all kind of different or kind of similar. They use several tasks, and even if they use the same abstract task, like a read mapper, then there are dozens or hundreds of different implementations of these read mappers. 
So this is a picture from the uh, sequence wiki and you see that there are 124 tools already entered for doing the read mapping. Yeah? So there are really many, many, many people. There are many, many people developing these tools and there are new tools appearing every day, literally every day, and there are new pipelines that are uh, necessary literally every day. So some more details, if we look into this runtime, um, you, you, you need to get high throughput. Uh, there are some properties of these workflows. So typically, many of the tasks are small, they are fast, and then there are some tasks that really need most of the time of the entire workflow. So there are much differing CPU and storage requirements. Uh, you really have to take care, as, as Jim pointed out, how you move the data from one task to the other. Um, so you need parallelization for high throughput, and if you want to have an open source big data genomics platform, then you have to take care that you support very different target hardware. So there will be some institutes that run it on EC2. Uh, that's, that's no go in Germany for privacy and legal reasons. We will never be allowed to upload anything to EC2 when we are entering medical. Uh, so we will have our own private clouds and many of the groups that I work together don't even have a private cloud. They buy one or two machines and then they have 40 threads in parallel and a parallel data infrastructure for NGS analytics at the moment also must support these more centralized approaches. And there's also, of course, some, some hype about uh, involving GPUs into this process because they can do some of the task very, very fast. And regarding the second aspect is variety. As I just said, for every task, and the task is not really defined, so think of a read mapper. There are dozens or even more ready-to-use implementations. Bioinformatics is an open source world, so you can download them all, install them, and run them. Um, the abstract tasks are not really defined. What a read mapper does is not defined. There are several pre-processing steps. There are several post-processing steps. Sometimes they are bundled into one task. Sometimes you know different tasks. So there's much overlapping functionality, and this leads to slightly different workflows. Uh, you have a lot of heterogeneous input and output formats, so you need to do a lot of forward transformation uh, if you want to use all these tasks as they are. Um, then what sometimes might be surprising, so for most of the tasks, there's no best tool. So if you think of read mapping, there is not the best read mapping tool, and there will never be one, because a read mapper is not only slow or fast, but it also produces different results. There's a lot of interpretation built into these tools. And if you look into 10 different benchmarks of read mappers, then you will have nine different results. And um, this is due to the fact that it's not really clear what, a read, what the optimal output of a read mapper is, because the data is different, the data, data is extremely noisy, and this leads to the fact that many people have their own little preferences of using this tool or this tool or this tool, and this is changing all the time. Now there are best practices for known problems, of course, uh, and these decay extremely rapidly. So the best practice pipeline for doing uh, 20,000 genome variation calling is probably a nude every six months because there's a couple of new tools and then there's here some experience and here some experience and the, 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 the sequencing machines change their internal procedures and now suddenly generate a different error model. So this is really changing uh, very, very rapidly. So now how can you solve these problems. Uh, I think there are three main ways, and this is now preparing for the panel tonight, in a way. Uh, of course, it's my own perspective. So the first one is you, uh, the manual way, right? So this is, for instance, implemented in GetK, and in essentially all the pipelines that I know. So most of the projects that I know, they build their own pipeline. So they do it in Perl, Python, or whatever. It's hard-coded scripts. They use p files for passing intermediate results. They have some form or none, custom parallelization, fault tolerance, and so on and so forth. Whatever they need, they have to build themselves. That's the traditional way. That's what bioinformaticians love, because they can build their own systems. And from my experience, it's the current solution for at least 80% of all the projects. Then there's the second approach. That is the, the, the newest, let's say. I would say it's, it's the big data way, uh, like Spark, Flink, GNQL, that's built in, in Italy. Uh, so different um, systems are now popping up where you can, that you can use. I, I would call these embedded parallelization. So essentially you have a language or an API and you can program your pipeline in this language or against this API and then it will try to do as much parallelization channel selection automatically. So it will try to deduce from what you specify the fastest way to implement, to, to run uh, your analysis. And this has some drawback. It often requires a re-implementation. And it often requires very specific skills. So you have to learn this API or you have to learn this language. And you can, you, you, even if it's in Python and you have an API in Python, you have to learn about the optimal way how you use uh, 
the system to, to achieve the, the throughput that is promised. And then there's a third way, actually the, the difference between the second and third is not very clear. I would call it a scientific workflow way. This is built in systems like Galaxy. This is what we are building, uh, Biobank Klaus. Uh, Apache Tase is going this way. There was a new CIDR paper just two weeks ago from New York where they built a similar system. So these build on a scientific workflow management system and uh, the main trick is to assemble lots of black box scripts. So to have many ready to use programs and you just build these pipelines. You completely focus on how you build the pipeline and then you have some infrastructure and some partially or limited form of automatic parallelization or channel selection. So scientific workflow versus scripting. Um, why is it better than scripting from my perspective? Well, you have an infrastructure. You need a scientific workflow management system and it offers you things like execution monitoring, uh, failure recovery, support for parallelization and scheduling, maybe even some optimization and task tree ordering. And regarding variety, you can start to share workflows. So there are workflow repositories where you can upload a workflow, annotate it, tag it, uh, search it. Uh, you have a, typically a limited expressivity, so the languages for specifying the workflow are not complete. It's not a Turing complete language, which should help to make the workflow easier to read and easier to develop. Uh, and they, they are very good at, at integrating foreign code. So that's sort of the, the main functionality is to be able to integrate all different forms of code. And there's also a third, um, a third view that you can have on scientific workflows. It's actually very much debated at the nature or science level and that is when you run an analysis through one of these uh, systems you are actually able to upload the workflow to a repository and this is the ultimate proof of what you have done. And you, you can even upload the entire execution trace and then everybody can really see what you have done and what has happened at the bit level. And this raises the credibility a lot. Uh, so this, this gives you a lot of uh, credibility on your result. So whoever started to read a methods part of a paper and then try to re-implement it will know that this is a real pain at the moment. Yes? Usually the methods part of papers are not detailed enough and you are not able to reproduce the result. So this has generated some traction. So there are repositories like my experiment with, which is not at all NGS but it's also uh, scientific uh, workflows in the bioinformatics community. And then my experiment repository at the moment has almost uh, 2,500 workflows that you can download, install, and run on the Taverna system. Um, and there's also a, a wider perspective to this. So there's a lot of debate in the publishers about the executable paper. I don't know if you heard about this, but this could be something where scientific workflow systems come in very handy. So if you look into one of these typical papers that have a computational part, then they all have a method section. And why wouldn't the publishers at some stage offer an upload option for an implementation of the method section? So you upload your workflow with the paper and you click on the method section and the workflow is executed. So that would be the ultimate vision. You don't have to re-implement anything but the code is already available. And then it must be written in something that you can execute on a remote machine so there must be some infrastructure of course. <coughs> So what's the difference between these embedded parallelism or big data infrastructures and scientific workflow management system? There's no clear separation from my point of view. Um, it, it depends on whether they focus on a re-implementation or on tool assembly, uh, how hard it is to integrate foreign tools, uh, the abstraction of the specification language, so you have a declarative language or you d are you doing it in Scala or, or Python? Uh, is there a focus on local computation or on web services? Do they support complex iterative tasks uh, like you use them in machine learning? And, and my take is if you specialize on next generation sequence analysis, uh, then you should rather focus on tool assembly because there are so many people developing new tools all the time. Um, integrating foreign tools should be as easy as possible. I have no clue what the optimal abstraction layer is for specifying such a workflow. For me, that's an entirely open question. And you, if you have different users, you will have very different requirements. Uh, you must f focus on local computation. So many scientific workflow systems are actually built around web services. That's a no-go if you enter the big data. And uh, these complex and iterative tasks, um, from my perspective, they are very rare, if there are any in next generation sequencing. So I, I didn't see them a lot. Um, but, but if you have them in your analysis, these are not well supported by scientific workflow systems. So that's definitely one point where you should uh, switch your system. 
Okay, this led us to the design rationals of the biobank system. Uh, the situation is as I just described, and we, we derived some requirements, highest extensibility, uh, supporting data and task parallelism, scriptable, very simple, run on different hardware, leverage the work of the 10,000 plus bioinformaticians in the world, building new read mappers all the time, and uh, ultimately also as a vision to build an ecosystem, so, so to have a, a more complete vision of what an open source platform would be for next generation sequencing analytics. Yeah, this led to a stack. I have th one slide for each of the uh, different layers. So as Jim pointed out, we have the uh, hop system built on HDFS. Then we have an F execution engine we call Highway. We have a workflow specification language we call Cuneiform. We have a dashboard for running uh, the cluster, setting up the cluster, monitoring, running the workflows. And we will have a workflow repository where, where workflows are ready to use uh, on your particular data. And there's a security model and a biobank data model around this. Yeah, the dashboard uh, Jim already presented. Cuneiform, it's a, it's a lightweight, statically typed data flow language. You will learn more about this tomorrow. So we have a hands-on demo. So we'll essentially keep it, uh, skip it here. Uh, the main focus was on direct integration of all sorts of different codes. So we, you can directly embed bash, cell, uh, bash shell uh, list programs, R programs, Python programs, programs, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's made, so what, when, when you run a cuneiform script, it's actually compiled into a data flow specification that is then given to the highway execution engine. And the highway execution engine, it's running, it's an, it's an application master for Yarn specifically made for scientific workflows. It will, it's, all this is alpha, as you know, all this is alpha. <laughs> it's work in progress, alpha versions. So we, we can run Cuneiform workflows, we can run Pegasus workflows, that, uh, that's more of a HPC batch system for workflows. And we are also able now to run Galaxy workflows. Not all, but most of them. And of course, our hope is to run them faster. Yeah. And there are some promising intermediate results, but I will not show them here. Yeah, we, we, we also have a focus on scheduling. So we want to do uh, optimal, op as good as possible, adaptive scheduling. Uh, a nice feature is uh, when you think about this credibility, uh, when you run a workflow in highway, it generates a provenance trace and you can rerun this provenance trace directly. So you can directly use it as a workflow specification. And we also support iteratively and dynamically expanding workflows. So that's different from something like Galaxy or Pegasus. So in Cunic form, you can define loops or conditionals. Yeah, that's my last slide. <coughs> that's, that's now vision. If we think about an open source big genomics, big data, big genomics data platform, uh, I think there are, there are various critical issues. So one is end user support, and one is developer support. If we think of end user support, then you need a library of ready to run workflows. So this is also something we will do in Biobank Cloud. We are implementing pipelines. That's uh, best practice pipelines from, from popular papers for SNP calling, for variant annotation, RNA-seq, chip-seq, and so on and so forth. You need, for the end user, you need some laboratory information management system connectors and some sample management. You need to take care about role-based data access because you will have different kind of users. You need some way of sharing, recommending, finding workflows and data uh, because most users are kind of, um, well, uh, not knowledgeable enough to make a good, their own decision on what workflow to run. Of course, there are different levels of, of uh, users. Some are very knowledgeable and some less. And what, what's really important from, from my point of view is um, th that you will not only run the workflow and produce some files somewhere, but that you will, be, that you will also be able to visualize the results and that you are able to, to integrate data integration. So many of these workflows, they do the read mapping and then comes the terrible bit where you start to look into, okay, it was a gene in this pathway and this is annotated with this functional annotation and it's this transcription factor and so on and so forth. And there you need to integrate a lot of different data, some private, some public. That's a lot of classical data integration, but this is actually also part of the workflow. And for the end users, this is much more decisive than the uh, 10% faster speed or the 5% higher accuracy. Um, yeah, and, th and they certainly want something like takeaway experiments. So you run the experiments, you press a button, you get a zip file, and everything is in there. You can upload the zip file, and then you can rerun it, and you have all the, the, the execution traces in there. Yeah, and from a developer support, uh, we, we build some of these in our project. So this automated cluster setup, resource management, logging, reporting, fault tolerance, as little configuration effort as possible. If you start to have specification scripts, you want to think about debugging, profiling. Uh, you need to support different target platforms. You, you 
get this partly if you build on something like Hadoop. Uh, and you, you should have something like a built-in privacy security. So in Germany, this is the big issue. Um, so you cannot just say it's, so you really need to take care about who is able to see what data. Yeah, and that's it. Um, thank you very much. Different people working on the project. Mark and Jürgen will give the tutorial tomorrow. Mark is already here. Uh, Jürgen will be here uh, tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much. I forgot about time, but are there any questions? Thanks for the good talk. You mentioned in the ecosystem slide uh, these things are really promising, but I'm afraid that if we start uh, right now, the open source projects are, are, the access, are more or less isolated islands. So is there some work going on uh, consolidating the effort or having a collaborative? This effort? workshop. <laughs> like that. Okay. I think, yeah, I don't, so. Yeah, no, that's a very honest answer, this workshop. That's the most important effort I know of of consolidating different works. Yeah. For example, the workflow generated by the Galaxy uh, yeah. now has to be uh, convertible to Cuneiform and the vice versa, something like that. So we have the different tools, and then each tool generates different data and takes input different data. So we have this problem that, uh, I mean, it will be different. I mean, it, it, it's, it will not be collaborated effort. So I mean, there should be something. Uh, I don't know. There should be something towards it to have a collaborated effort or something like that. Yes. Otherwise, we have another <laughs> extent. Yeah. Of yeah. But, but that's a very, very difficult question. So we have this panel tonight. It's, uh, of course, at the moment, we are all running in competition mode, let's say. Uh, and maybe at some stage, there will emerge standards, standards of how you at least, so there, for instance, is a standard of how you can specify provenance traces. So all the workflow execution engines, or all the execution engines could generate this model of provenance, and then you have only, you, you can build tools around this standard for provenance, and everybody can look into the execution traces of your script, whatever the execution engine was. And maybe there will be standards for specifying a workflow. Maybe Hadoop Yarn is, well, was at some stage kind of a de facto standard for running the execution, but now it's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's losing track, let's say, in the research community. Huh? It's, it's more and more important in the industry, I think, but the researchers are going on and saying, no, 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 this is putting too much burden on us and we have to build more flexible models. How much there will be standardization, I don't know. The biobankers are very strong in standardization, so they force a lot on, on standardization, but it's more on sample description and this type of stuff. OK. Can, can you tell us more about the tutorial tomorrow? Uh, there will. So tomorrow uh, in the morning, there are two tutorials. One is from the Adams people uh, somewhere here, right, him. Uh, and some is from the Biobank Cloud project. So in the tutorial tomorrow, we will, you will, if you want to. You, so you please bring your machine. Uh, and you will either install your own VM or you will run on, or we will give a demo on a public VM. It depends on the network and it, it, it's not yet uh, fixed, so not yet set up everything. But you will be able to, to run workflows, to specify workflows in Cuneiform, to execute them. We will start by simple hello world and then have a word count and then have a bioinformatics, tutorial, a bioinformatics workflow. And you can see how you specify a workflow, how you run it, how you can manage it, how you can edit it, and so on. And in the Adam tutorial, uh, he will probably explain us after his talk. So that's it's I think it's a two hour in the morning starting at I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think I have the program here actually. Uh, so from nine on there's the Adam Spark tutorial and from ten forty five on there's the Cuneiform Highway tutorial. And and there's more time in the afternoon. So you Developers are here, and you can start building your own complex pipelines, and the developers will help you. As I said, this is all alpha. Actually, Biobank Cloud is pre-release. <laughs> uh, you can have a bit here and a bit here, but we haven't yet packaged it all into, please download here, and you have exactly the following functionality. We are in the middle of, we are in the middle of preparing this release. OK, thanks a lot. So I think now we have a break. Is that true? Yes. No, 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 sorry. We have KO um, talking. Yeah.